Hey, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is David Moss. I am the CEO and the founder of StrongBlock, a blockchain as a service company in based in um, around the world. Actually, we're a global company. And in this interview that Marina uh, is going to do with me, I'm going to be talking about some insights. Hopefully, they're valuable to you about what I've learned in my professional life. David, thank you very much for joining us on the Yex channel. So let's start for uh, asking you the first question. From music to cryptocurrencies, how did you manage to go from one industry to a totally different one? Okay, well, that's a great question and it's a long path. I'll make the story short. I started off as a um, professional musician in high school and I was playing in clubs when I was fairly young and uh, playing with a band and practicing guitar 10 hours, eight to 10 hours a day. And uh, was doing that um, up until my early 20s and was playing all over, the, the, all over the, the United States and Canada. So in the United States and Canada. And at a certain point, started getting very interested in computers. And so I was lucky enough that I was able to, uh, coming back from a very, very long um, road trip with my band, uh, was able to say, what should I do with the rest of my life? And it's one of those things that you look back and say, when I'm, when I'm 10 years older than I am now, I think I was 22, what, should, what, what is my 32-year-old self going to be really happy that I did? People say, well, what is my 30-year-old self going to be happy about what I did for my 20-year-old self? And I said, well, I would like to have a profession besides music, because right. music, as much as I love music, it just doesn't pay unless you're um, a very popular artist. And there are some people who are very popular. Maybe I thought, well, I'm going bald. Maybe I won't be as, uh, as a, uh, attractive. Maybe I don't live in the right city. I lived in, in Portland, Oregon. Maybe there are some things out there, but I also came from a family of physicians. And I thought, well, I'll go to medical school. That's what I'll do. And 10 years from now, I'll be a doctor. And then I went to school and I discovered computer science. And it turned out it was something that I excelled in. And so I kept playing in the band. But while I was going to school, I got very excited about computers. And so that is a longer road. Getting to blockchain is a longer road. But I, out of school, I joined Oracle Corporation. And Oracle is a worldwide database corporation, and I became a specialist there, worked on some huge projects. One of them was for the um, a plane. In, in, in Europe, the, the planes are usually made by Airbus, but in the United States and others, other places, they're made by Boeing. And so I worked on the Boeing 777 project. I was one of the leads on that project. And so I was lucky enough to be able to work on some very large, complicated projects. And so the transition from being a musician was gradual because I still played while I was in school. Then when I started to work full time, it became harder and harder to be a, a, a professional musician. I still practiced, still had a home recording studio, but no longer went out there and played a lot of gigs. And so after I started working full time, I was unable to, to do that as much as I wanted. So one of the things that happened to me, though, is that after doing something, starting a very big company in the United States, a, a technology company for cars, it's called Edmunds.com. It had auto information. We were one of the top, we actually were the top um, 100 corporations. I think we were number 30 on the internet. So we were the 30th most trafficked website in the world when I, when I helped build that company. I was able to leave that company and not have to work for a while. And I thought, oh, I worked so hard. I went, I was a musician. I went to school. I worked for, for quite a while, built this company. Now I get to do whatever I want. So what I wanted to do was go back to music. So I went back to music and was left to start working with young bands and some of my own music. And some of those things that we were able to do um, included um, songs that were played on the radio, on TV, in movies that I was able to produce. And so I got my second chance doing that. But in the middle of all of that, um, I started discovering cryptocurrency and blockchain. And again, the music stuff was lots and lots of fun, almost no money in it. 
again. And I, I, I love doing it. I got to work with some some amazing artists, um, uh, names that and, and, and groups that, that I'm sure that you would know. But I got excited about technology again. And the same decision came twice. I got to work in blockchain and cryptocurrency. And so that's a, a, a fairly long explanation. But that was the path is music, technology, another opportunity for music at a much, much higher level. This was the radio, television uh, level, and then technology again, and this time moving into blockchain and cryptocurrencies. So inspirational. So you had a successful career. Have you ever thought to fail? Well, actually, um, in the middle of the music thing, the second, the, my second music renaissance, I, um, that right when I was moving into doing something in technology again, I had a company called uh, Crowd Rules, and it was a crowdsourcing company, and it was pre-blockchain and pre-crowd um, uh, uh, funding, but it was a crowd a crowdfunding idea. And I was maybe five years early for that, and we, um, I built, I built the product, and we started pitching it to the venture capitalists and try to get people interested in it. And everybody said, "Oh, this kind of thing, no one will ever do that." And so um, I had to sell the company uh, for nothing, uh, and I had to sell my my big house and move into a small house. Really? And I had and I had to start over and go to work for other people for a period of time. And that company completely folded. Three years later, crowdsourcing companies were everywhere. I was so early that and that's one of the things my big learning from that was, well, it doesn't matter if I know I'm right. It depends on how long I can wait till other people see that that's going to happen. And so people that were pitching blockchain products back in 2010, um, they couldn't wait around until 2015 when they started taking oh. off. If they couldn't wait, then they couldn't. So, so that was a big failure. Um, pretty much lost everything. Had to start over. Um, and um, but I had my tech skills, and so I was able to work for others for a period of time uh, up till you know, up till I was able to start a new company. Were there important people in your in your uh, professional life who helped you? Well, I was lucky enough that different times I've had different people helping me. When I joined Oracle Corporation, there was a man there who um, I expressed interest in what's called data modeling. And it's the idea of looking at how, well, it was relational databases, this Oracle. So you're looking at, well, we need to keep track of all the information for a supply chain, like at Boeing, all the supply chain information to be able to build a, a 777. This particular person said, if you come to work for Oracle, I will show you how to do data modeling such that you can even do it and you can teach. And he kept his promise. And so I, it was something I really wanted to learn. And so that was one of my, I think the first really big mentor in, um, in technology was this gentleman at Oracle Corporation who taught me data modeling. And then for blockchain, I had another person, um, uh, two people, one person who really just encouraged me to work in blockchain, and then the other who introduced me to um, uh, a very uh, a CEO at a very prominent company in blockchain. So um, that was a really important uh, th that was a really important thing. But those I think those two people, the one at Oracle and the one in blockchain, those were very pivotal things for me, and they were very supportive of of me and my set of skills, but bringing me into a new area that I didn't know that much about. David, which was the most important decision you took and which were the consequences? Well, there again, there were two that parallel what I just talked about. At Oracle, I had a choice of joining a number of other co companies. Oracle, interestingly enough, uh, nothing against Oracle, they didn't pay people very well at the time that I joined. And I could have made almost double working for another company. And so when I made that decision to join Oracle, I knew that I was going to make less money, but it was the same decision that I had made 
as a musician, what is myself going to say 10 years from now? I knew that Oracle was going to be a big corporation. Even the recruiters trying to get me to go other places said, well, Oracle may not be around that long. Now, of course, you and I both know that Oracle is one of the top technology companies in the world. I knew it was going to be, and it wasn't that early. There were already thousands of employees at Oracle when I joined, um, even in consulting. I think there were already, I, my employee number was in the 4,000s, I think. So that decision, the first one, the Oracle decision was, do I take a pay cut? And um, then... 10 years from now, I can say I worked at Oracle Corporation. It turned out for, for many years after leaving Oracle Corporation, people would look on my resume and say, oh, you worked at Oracle Corporation. That was golden. So it was a sacrifice to go there. But afterwards, I could say I worked at Oracle. So now the blockchain one, same thing happened. I'm looking back, trying to look back at myself 10 years from now when you, sit, you, you have your, your, your 30-year-old self congratulating your your 20 year old self on a great decision um my 40 year old self looking back on a, on a decision um the same thing looking at blockchain i was working in crypto and blockchain i had a lot of people who were encouraging me, me to work in different areas i did a lot of white papers i did a lot of consulting i was very excited to be in there i had projects that I was going to be the CEO of and I was going to build myself and I was all excited about it. And then one day I was at a, uh, a meeting of a group of people very prominent in Santa Monica, California, um, who were all in crypto and blockchain. And I met the CEO of a company called Block One. Uh, and they are the company that created a cryptocurrency called EOS and the software called EOSIO. It was very early on. They had published a white paper. They were raising money doing an ICO that was a daily one for 350 days, but they had not they had not built their technology yet and really just had one person um, primarily working on it, who's the CTO, Dan Larimer. Um, uh, and I, the CEO, asked me to call up the CTO and talk with him about some concerns I had. And at that same meeting, I had just met the CEO the person who introduced the two of us sat us down and said, both of you I've known for over a decade. You both have skills that you need each other to solve the problem of building EOS. I think you guys need to figure out how to work with each other. Could you please do that for me? And then about two hours later, same gathering after I talked with the CTO by phone, they said, would you please join the core team at block one? And uh, and can you be in Blacksburg, Virginia tomorrow? Now, um, that was impossible. I, 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 I actually, by the way, didn't say yes at this meeting. Um, I said, let me think about it. And uh, we went out to dinner, did other things. And within a couple of days, I think this was like a Tuesday or Wednesday, by the following Monday, I was in Blacksburg, Virginia. And I had dropped everything else I was doing to go to work specifically at block one as employee number two. I was actually the first person who was on payroll um, besides Dan Larimer, the CTO. So I made this decision in the same way I made the Oracle decision and the music decision. It's like, if I could spend a year or more of time working with the best person out there that I know in blockchain, Dan Larimer, would I do that? I would pay money to do that. That would be like getting a PhD in blockchain. And so, um, they happened to, to, to pay very, very well, and they were, they were just getting started and getting the technology group together, and there were all sorts of things, and it was stressful, and there was lots and lots of work, but that decision, for me, then led to my being able to get the product out, EOSIO, be the person who co-led the launch of the EOS mainnet, and start um, my own company, StrongBlock, because I had the reputation from throwing myself completely into block one. So again, looking out five years and looking back, so that was 2017, it's, a part, it's now it's, it's 2020. So three years ago at this time, I made that decision. And now 
I was already doing things, like I said, in blockchain and crypto, but that decision was huge for me. And it was huge in that I learned so much working there that now I'm considered one of the top people in blockchain. And that was because I took that really, really big chance and it changed my life again. So you can see the pattern there emerging that I keep making these exactly. all in decisions. Um, and then congrat, no, I'm patting myself on the back right now for three years ago, making this decision to go all in working for block one, even though there was nobody else there. And I had to kind of start from scratch. So, uh, is there any key moment or, the, or decision you made that completely changed to your life? Um, I would say that, um, the same, the, same, the same thing that we we're just talking about, I'd say that the key decisions that I've made um, have always been based around looking back at what I've already done and um, or, you know, look, being able to look back 10 years from now at, at myself right now. And um, I actually got that. There's um, This is an older, uh, um, probably now more obscure um, person who wrote on business, uh, a, a guy by the name of Stephen Covey. And he had um, uh, two books, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People yeah. and another mm -hmm. book called Principle Centered Leadership. And that's where I learned mostly about this looking back, you know, 10 years from I didn't even know that I was doing that. I read the book and it's like, oh, this makes sense. I need to look back on my life. So the key decision, I would say, um, for blockchain was going to work for block one. And it was instead of starting my own company at the time, and I had to then postpone starting my own company for uh, about uh, over a year in order to do that. So that one, walking away from being a musician, you know, those are all very key decisions. And so I would say that really changed my life. Now, am I sad that I don't perform um, as much in, in public for, for music? Well, I've substituted that with being on stage doing keynotes around the world. And so I still try to bring some of that energy, but I don't go up there with the guitar anymore. And so there's there's some sad, I think there's some sadness in there as well. But those are, I think those are the key moments, really. Um, the big ones is joining Oracle, joining Block One, um, and, and, and you know walking away from music, joining Oracle, doing admins.com, going back to music, Realizing I wasn't going to work for my family, I needed to have more money coming in, and uh, that, so I so there's a series of key decisions that all go around that one theme of taking the risk and looking at what this will be like ten years from now and how it will how it will age, even though there's risk and there's change and it's it's uncomfortable. I would say that most all the things I'm talking about they were uncomfortable, they were very uncomfortable to do, and they required a lot of work. And um, that's really the, the key decision is I am willing to put the work in. Sure. So your story rep represents the American dream. How important was it to work in the United States, the land of innovation? Well, uh, there are many countries that have had wonderful innovation as well. I would say that Switzerland and Italy and other places all have a, incredible innovation and, and anybody can do that. United States is unique in that um, there, there is a kind of less of a history, and so everybody can invent themselves more. So everything that I described to you is about inventing yourself and saying, well, I was a musician. I had, when I had hair, and I'll, I'll send you a picture if you're interested, when I had hair, um, I, I never imagined, imagined that I could do anything else than be a musician. And in many cases, once you've made a, ch a choice in other, in certain countries, you're kind of stuck with that choice. Your family, society, everybody wants you to do it. In the United States, um, I live on the West Coast of, of the United States. That's, you know, I had grown up in Oregon, but have been in Los Angeles for 20 years now and also lived and worked in San Francisco. San Francisco, San Jose, that's the hub. That's Oracle is San, San, uh, San Francisco. It's the hub of that. So innovation, American dream, all of the other things out there. I think the United States does provide an advantage, but what I've just described, I don't know if there's anything restricting any person who wants to do something different from pursuing that dream. Again, it's you make the decision, you look at what, what is it gonna be like 10 years from now, and you say, am I willing to sacrifice now for something that's gonna come later? But 
it certainly helped in the United States to have been a citizen here uh, because there's a lot of support for doing that. And, you know, it, it I, as long as you have friend, friends and family supporting you, I think that 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 it's not as important to be in the U.S. But um, so, again, I'm not advocating everybody move to the U.S. I'm saying you can do this anywhere. You need the support of family and friends when you're making these big decisions in your life. Sure. Uh, David, the coronavirus has a violent impact on companies, young executives, and managers. Is there any advice you'd like giving them? Well, right now, uh, um, Marina, you and I were talking before the interview started just about how much this has affected everyone. And in the United States, for example, um, we work with uh, China and Saudi Arabia and Korea and uh, Trinidad, all sorts of other places besides the United States. Every one of our clients, everyone we know, every country, as you know, is deeply impacted, will be impacted for some time. The thing that I most worry about for people's futures is, are there certain professions that are just going to be hard to, to bounce back? I've been lucky enough to stay in technology. And interestingly enough, we talked about um, uh, the kind of thing that you can do. In technology, my team, I had a meeting with my team just before this, uh, and we did it just like we're doing here on a video conference. And I haven't seen my team members in person since December. But we have been working as a virtual team since we started in July of 2018. We rarely see each other. We sometimes, the, the most we run into each other is um, Thomas, uh, uh, our chief governance officer, and I ran into each other in Switzerland. Uh, when we were there, but I hadn't seen him for three months prior. So in the time of the coronavirus, it's, well, first, stay healthy. Make sure that you keep others around you healthy. Look for the opportunities that come from this. There are opportunities to get involved in certain kinds of uh, new movements, technology and uh, and uh, COVID detection, for example. There's a huge group of people out there working on uh, getting back to work. And so there are lots of opportunities there. I would say, in as in any crisis, look at the skills you have. Again, you'll, you'll notice my theme was, I'm, I'm a really organized person. Everything that I did has to do with being organized. In the coronavirus, look at your best skills and say, well, I'm, I'm right now I'm working as, um, as a uh, an, an marketing person, but I'm very organized and very detail oriented. What things could I do with marketing and advertising down that I could use those same skills, but are in demand right now because of what's gonna be happening with um, the coronavirus um, imp impact over the next couple of years. So no matter what, there's an opportunity now. Um, I have you know, I have a number of friends who are using this time to say, oh, well, I've been working in this profession for a while. I have some money. I'm getting unemployment. I've got a stimulus check um, from the United States. Maybe it's time for me to make that change to the thing that I really wanted to do. If you're going to do that, my advice is, you know, make sure that you have an understanding of what the profile is for that profession over the next couple of years. Maybe it's a good time to go back to school and get a degree, probably online. Maybe it's a good time to work in another area. If you're planning on being a, um, a host on a cruise ship um, as your new profession, probably not going to work out for you. So I would say be very careful about what you're looking at, you know, what thing you're choosing to make right. sure that, well, I've always wanted to be a cruise director on a cruise ship, probably a terrible time to make that life decision. Right. Okay, uh, David, today's context is very complex. Nothing like this has ever been seen before. What do you expect the future to look like? Will it change the way we work? I think more people are going to, to be working from home. And the, the funny thing is, is that, as I mentioned, my team has been working from home since its conception. And that was very specific. That means that people will have to get used to the distractions of home. They'll have to be more focused on what they do. They'll have to um, uh, make sure that... Um, They'll have to make sure that they are choosing professions that they can that, that they can they're able to work in. They'll have to make sure that they stay healthy. 
uh, it, it's going to be a very interesting and challenging time. I know that technology will be a very important factor in that. So again, I'm, I'm always advocating technology and, um, and some of those skills, but not everybody can work in technology. It maybe is only 20 to 25% of the workforce. And so I'm much more interested in making sure that everybody has something that they can do. I would say that over the next five years, more work from home, more technology and skills where you're, you're, you, they are in demand working from home. Um, there's an opportunity to create brand new businesses. I, I'd say that things like you know uh, delivery, um, odd, you know uh, d delivery of different kinds of goods, um, and, you know from groceries to restaurant food, etc. That's going to be even bigger. You probably saw the there's a curve that shows Uber, and it shows yeah. Uber's mm -hmm. um, people, uh, and it shows the huge, huge drop in people riding an Uber. But Uber Eats. I'm not sure if Uber Eats is outside of the United States, but Uber Eats food delivery is going up, up like this. Yeah. And so I would say there's going, this is going to take us years to recover from. Not just, you know, not just everybody's going to, the 22 million people out of work in the United States aren't all going to go to work. We open it back up in two months they're not all gonna be going back to work. It's gonna be a long-term thing. So I think that we're gonna to need to have things like um, universal basic income, universal health care, and other things like that, that allow people to have a, a living wage, be able to do things they need to do. And we may, as a country and as a world, provide different kinds of things like we did in the 1930s in the United States in the 40s during the Great Depression, where we're providing, um, we had a thing called the Civilian Conservation Corps, where the government mm -hmm. provided many jobs Jobs, did infrastructure, all sorts of other stuff. So there are going to be a lot of changes. I think that this is going to be, it's like coming out of the Great Depression uh, from 100 years ago. Um, I, I think it's what it's going to be like. So it's going to be a long, slow uh, set of changes. So. Okay. And the last question uh, Would you share with us five tips to be successful? Okay. Um, I would say that one of the big things. Um, uh, that, that we want to make sure that we have is the um, is passion. In the middle of all of that, it makes a really big difference if you are passionate about whatever it is that you're doing, because it will get you through times that are hard, uncomfortable, stressful. That really helps. But then you need to have practice along with those things. If you're going to be passionate about guitar, well, I've seen people who are passionate about guitar that have only practiced two times and they'll get up there and they'll have all sorts of emotion and it will be horrible to listen to. So if you're going to take passion, have, you know, practice it. And then I would say that um, you need to have resilience. If things don't work out the way that you hoped they'd work out when you want them to work out, well, it doesn't mean that they're not going to work out right now. Look at all the people who are hoping that they were going to finish their, their degree um, next month. And now they've got to wait maybe six months to do it. So resilience means having the, having the ability to keep going no matter what. And so um, I would say then, uh, and, and some people call that grit, by the way. So we're talking passion and practice and resilience or grit. And then um, I would say that, you need to have an idea of what the bigger picture is. You know, looking ten years back from what you are doing. You know, what what is the big picture? Not just am I learning um, how to program in one computer language or how to do you know how to assemble one thing? How do I do assembly of a phone? Not how do I assemble one part of a phone? So I would say that it's looking at a bigger vision um, for what you want to do, and then just um, I would say be kind. Um, for me, it's um, other people are going through stuff and you have no idea right now. I, I know that you and everyone listening has friends who have passed away or who are sick or have friends who are passed away or sick. And so in the middle of all of this stuff, no matter what you're doing for yourself, think of others, be kind. David, thank you very much for this inspiring interview and congratulations on your incredible and successful life. We hope to see you soon in Lugano to share other life and career experiences with our YEX community. Thank you. I look forward to it. Thank you for the interview. Thank you very much. Marina Bottinelli, YEX Lugano.